thought maybe we could do this one in person, but COVID has given us other ideas here. Let's see. There we go. Okay, we are off and running. I'm gonna see if I can make myself a little smaller here so I don't take up part of the screen. Okay, um, we're talking tonight about herbs. Um, we're gonna talk about growing, harvesting, preserving, and using herbs. Um, this is a program that someone requested at one of our other um, talks. And so we're gonna try and take on this topic tonight. Um, herbs, um, a definition, what is an herb? It's the leaves of a low growing shrubs or plants. Um, some of them are perennials, which means they come back every year. And some of them are annuals, which means you have to plant them each year. Uh, some examples would be parsley, chives, marjoram, thyme, basil, caraway, dill, oregano, rosemary, savory, sage, and celery leaves. Um, we're probably used to using these in the fresh or dried form. Um, the fresh forms you can buy in grocery stores of many of these. And the dried forms may be found as whole leaves, crushed or ground. Uh, many herbs can be grown in the United States and we can grow them indoors or out of doors. Um, herbs are different from a spice because spices come from the bark. An example of that would be cinnamon, the root, which would be ginger, onion, and garlic, the buds, which include cloves and saffron, the seeds, which include things like yellow mustard, poppy, and sesame seeds, the berry, such as black pepper, or the fruit of um, a particular plant. And those would be examples of allspice and paprika. And most of these spices are tropical trees or plants. Um, there are a few that can be grown in the United States, but many of them cannot be grown in the United States. Um, the history of herbs is really long. People have been using herbs for many, many, many years. Um, you can th even think back of how they have altered the course of history where people uh, spent a lot of time and resources to obtain herbs, to bring herbs from one part of the world to another. Um, they sometimes are used, were used as a medium of exchange and trade. Um, people all over the world have used herbs for cooking and medicinally for thousands of years. And many of our modern medicines are derived from plants and we are finding that um, some herbs and also some spices have um, beneficial um, antioxidants and other types of chemicals in them, which are really good for our health. Um, some examples um, that we know of now Time that spice is a powerful antioxidant as well as an antiseptic. Um, drink a tea made from lemon thyme to treat colds before bed. Um, don't use it when you're pregnant though. My mouse keeps going farther ahead than I want to. Ah. Okay. Um, Sage, it's recommended to gargle with a broth made from a quarter cup of leaves, which has been boiled and cooled to relieve a sore throat. Parsley is an immune system booster. One tablespoon of chopped flat leaf or curly parsley daily is good for your immune system. Chewing partly, parsley neutralizes breath odors. So that little sprig of parsley that's on your um, plate as a garnish, sometimes in a restaurant can help to uh, overpower your uh, garlic breath or something else that you ate during the meal. Um, mint is ideal for treating collie wobbles, which you might know as butterflies in the stomach. Um, sip a tea made with fresh peppermint leaves to soothe stomach cramps, nausea, and flatulence. For natural decongestant, place a fistful of mint leaves in a shallow bowl and cover them with boiling water. Lean over it, drape a towel over your head and breathe the steam. Lemon balm um, can be used for healing and preventing cold sores. 
You can also rub the leaves directly onto skin as a natural insecticide uh, repellent or to soothe bites. Lavender has an antiseptic and anti-inflammatory properties. Crush a handful of the heads and add to a bowl of boiling water to use as a steam bath for your face. Um, basil, can you can use the crushed leaves and rub them on your temples to relieve headaches or pour boiling water over basil leaves for a pain relieving foot bath. And we all are pretty commonly um, familiar with aloe vera. Uh, you break open the thick leaves and apply the gel inside to um, soothe your skin when you get burns. So these are some examples of um, some of the ways that herbs, the leaves of plants have been used in the past as um, medicinal uh, solutions for various problems because many years ago people had nothing to use except the natural things. Uh, let's talk a little bit about growing herbs. Most of them prefer uh, full sun. You have more oils develop in brighter light and that in, uh, gives better flavor and fragrance. Um, that's what we use our herbs for is the fragrance and the oils in the herbs are what give it the flavor and the fragrance. Most of them prefer fertile garden soil. Um, they can be grown in containers or they can be put in with your flowers or vegetables in beds. Um, most of them need regular watering, but also need well-drained soil. So you want to avoid really heavy compacted or clay soils. Um, there are some exceptions to the rule. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. You need to plant the right herb in the right spot, just like any other thing you do with gardening, the right plant in the right place. Um, lavender, marjoram, rosemary, sage, savory, and thyme uh, do really well in hot sun and rather lean soil, kind of sandy or well-drained. Um, Dill also kind of fits into that category. Basil, chives, coriander or cilantro, and parsley prefer a little bit richer soil with more frequent watering. By the way, coriander is the seed of the cilantro plant. And in the UK, coriander um, is called cilantro, or all cilantro is called coriander. And there is no such thing as cilantro in their vocabulary. Um, these are some herbs that will tolerate some shade, in other words, part sun, a, a few hours of sun a day, and still um, grow fairly well. Um, basil, chervil, chives, coriander, parsley, sage, sorrel, tarragon, and the mints. And of course, when you plant a mint, you have to be careful that you uh, have it in an area where it's not going to spread. A uh, common way to plant it is to cut the bottom out of a, a flower pot or a container of some kind and um, put that container in the soil, then put your soil inside the container and plant your mint plant inside there. Mint is very famous for taking off and running over and overtaking any other part of the garden that's near it. So that's one caveat when you are uh, growing mint, you want to keep it in an enclosed area or perhaps you have it in a small bed where there are some kind of borders all the way around that bed where you're growing mint. Um, so that's, what, that's probably the only one that um, kind of goes wild in that way. Um, some, we said some herbs like soil on the dry side um, oregano, rosemary, lemon balm, lavender, and dill. Um, a lot of the herbs that originated in the Mediterranean region like the soil with the dry, drier thing. You don't want to overwater these plants. Um, where can you grow herbs? Um, outdoors, of course. Um, they can be grown in patio pots, vegetable gardens, flower gardens, containers, kitchen gardens. Um, because they're often smaller plants than many of our other vegetable plants, they're ideal for putting into containers and smaller space areas. You might just have, say, a two by two foot area kind of near your back door, kitchen door, that when you want to get the fresh herbs, you just step outside and pick yourself some fresh herbs. 
Um, it's also possible to grow many of them indoors. Some get a little bit bigger than others. Um, and windowsills and plant stands with additional light um, are good places to grow herbs also. You need to have them in a, usually a south facing window so it gets as much sun as possible during the winter time. Um, where, how do you start herb plants? Depending on the herb, you can start it from seed and some common ones we have in our gardens from seeds are basil, oregano, dill, um, those types of things. And people commonly plant those from seeds. You can purchase transplants um, from garden centers. A few herbs do not transplant well and should be put directly, the seeds directly where you want them to grow. Um, anise, coriander, dill, and fennel should be sown directly in the garden. They have um, a very strong, deep um, tap root, which means it's a, a single root that goes far down in the soil. And so they don't like being disturbed when you transplant them. You can also start herbs from cuttings. You can take um, a small branch with a few leaves on it from many of the herbs. Um, and if your friends, relatives, neighbors have herbs and they're willing to share that with you, you can start herbs that way. You can take divisions of the root part of some of the herbs. Um, I did this presentation or prepared this one several years ago. Um, we're not really recommending that now because of the jumping worms um, that you share plants or the roots parts of plants be, uh, among people. And we can maybe talk, remind me later in the talk, if we have time at the end, I'll tell you a little more about jumping worms. Um, you can take um, uh, like a little twig or a, a small stem of plants and root them in um, potting soil or sometimes in a glass of water. Um, doing that, you oftentimes need to have a, a rooting hormone that helps it to get the roots growing faster. And many herbs self sow once you get them going. Um, I planted dill the first year I had my garden and I never had to plant dill afterwards because it replanted, it reseeded itself every year after that especially if you don't pull everything out each year. Um, fertilizing, most herbs grow best on the lean side. In other words, you don't wanna to fertilize too much, only maybe once during the growing season, unless your soil is very poor or the plant shows signs of deficiencies. And that would be like yellowing of the leaves, um, even though you're giving it enough water. Leaves can also yellow from too much water but generally um, the leaves don't look like a nice, hearty, healthy green. Um, you might have leaves that have um, a dark vein in them and then lighter on the rest of the, the leaf, that might be also showing some deficiencies that the plant needs a little fertilizer. For herbs, um, general fertilizer with the numbers 5, 10, 5 is usually a good choice. Um, rosemary and thyme really prefer quite lean soil. And if you add a little bit of compost when you plant it, um, that's probably enough for it to do well, um, even though you don't fertilize at all. Mulching is always a good idea, it prevents water loss in the summer, it keeps the weeds down. And if you have perennial herbs, it prevents frost heave by providing more constant temperature. Um, that applying the mulch in the fall, wait till the ground freezes and then put your mulch down. That could be like straw or chopped leaves or something like that. Um, and it also helps to protect the perennials from the harsh winter winds and that sort of thing. My thing here doesn't, doesn't want to behave. Um, so you want to uh, plant those plants in, uh, and keep them a little bit sheltered in the winter. Um, pinching is something that's often done to herbs because you want to get the most leaves that you can. And so what you do is when you get the herb going and it's got several branches or, or leaves, um, you tip, you pinch off the very tips of the branches. You take off just what is growing um, above the 
top pair of leaves or the top uh, two or three leaves. And what happens then is you remove that tip and that causes the plant to shoot out more side branches wherever there's a place where the leaf and the, and the stem come together, there's a little bud in there that will start to grow. And so instead of having just one stem, you'll probably have at least two, sometimes as many as six or eight new stems coming up. And that of course gives you more leaves. Um, so it causes the plant to become bushier. If the herb produces flower buds, they can be removed to pro prolong the production of leaves. Once the plant starts to set flowers, then it's saying, okay, I'm getting ready to reproduce myself here and I don't need to start to keep growing more leaves. I'm just going to make flowers and seeds. And so um, if you pinch off the flower buds, that will help to keep the plant producing leaves longer. Uh, most herbs, because of the strong oils and uh, the, the fragrance they have, um, are not bothered very much by insects. There are a few herbs that, however, are susceptible to mildews and other diseases. A very common one is um, basil downy mildew, um, and it's become quite a problem in Wisconsin for people who grow herbs to sell. So you want to buy a resistant variety if you can. You want to space out the plants so that they're not too crowded. Um, and when you do that pinching and the plants get shrubbier, then you need to start also harvesting the leaves to keep it from getting too thick. Um, so good air circulation, proper spacing help to um, prevent some of the diseases. And um, some things, things you do not want to dis uh, expose herbs to are non-organic pesticides. Um, probably any pesticides, because remember, you're going to be eating these. So you wanna be careful about what you use to control um, diseases. Um, harvesting, a general rule of thumb, after the buds just begin to form, but before the plant begins to flower, that's the point at which it probably has the highest oil content and therefore the um, greatest flavor. Um, harvest lightly the first year if you're doing perennial plants. After that, you can harvest a little more heavily. Um, early morning before the heat of the day, but after the dew has dried is the ideal time to pick the leaves off the plant. Take more, no more than one third of the foliage of perennials at a time if you plan to harvest again. Um, on annuals like um, basil, you can take two thirds of the foliage. And then when it grows back again, you can take another two thirds. That plant doesn't have to um, worry about storing enough energy to last over the winter. So annuals, you can harvest more heavily. Most herbs will continue to produce new leaves unless they're allowed to flower and set seed like we talked about. And if you're harvesting from perennial plants and you want them to be healthy for the following year, um, stop cutting perennials, the leaves off of the perennials in late summer, which would be like the mid to the end of August. And that allows the plant to harden off and prepare for winter. Um, choosing and using herbs. I'm just going to check the chat here. I see we have one question. Oh, that's just the, uh, the reference to the um, handouts. Okay, if you're buying herbs in the grocery store or the market, these are some things you want to check out. Look for bright green leaves. If anything looks wilted or limp, that those are not fresh herbs. Um, if you can smell it, it should smell like the herb. It shouldn't have a kind of a musty smell. Um, buy only what you can use in about a week, which is why they give you those little tiny bundles in the store. Um, if you have a large bundle, you can share it with friends or family. And I'm also gonna talk about how you can preserve some of those uh, herbs if you have more than you can use at any one time. And the two best ways of doing that are by drying or freezing. Let's see here. 
storing fresh herbs. Um, if you buy it in the store, remove the rubber band or the string holding the bundle. Um, nowadays, many times they come in a little plastic package. You wanna wash herbs really well under running water or fill a sink or a bowl with water and then swish the herbs around in the water and um, remove them from the water. Repeat that until there's no more dirt washing out into the wash water. Then you can pat them dry with a towel or dry in a salad spinner. The salad spinner works really well um, for drying off many, many things besides lettuce greens. I use it also for um, taking the moisture off of vegetables when I'm freezing after I've uh, chilled them in the cold water. Storing them. Cut the stems on the diagonal and put the herbs in a glass of water like you would put cut flowers in a vase. Um, you need to change the water daily to keep it fresh and then cover it loosely with a plastic bag or if the plastic bag doesn't have holes in it, perforate the bag for a little bit of air circulation. You wanna store it in the warmer part of the refrigerator because they're quite tender and many of them will freeze if you have it in the bottom part of the refrigerator. Generally, the door or the uh, upper shelves of your refrigerator are warmer than the bottom. If you are storing them this way, they can last a week or more. However, the flavor will diminish over time. Um, if you are gonna preserve herbs, you know, if you can, um, if you have some of them and you wanna keep them, for use other than the growing time during the summer, harvest only as much as you can take care of in a short time. You don't wanna harvest them and leave them lay for a day or two before you take care of them. If you can't preserve right after cutting, store in the water, like we talked about in the refrigerator, like cut flowers. Again, you wanna wash them well in running water. Um, you may find insects in them. You may also have dirt from the garden. So you wanna wash them really well. Then again, dry them with paper towels or put them in your salad spinner. Large leaved herbs can be removed from the stem if you want to. And that depends if you're going to dry them or freeze them. Small leaved herbs can be left on the stem. Large leaved herbs would be things like basil um, and small leaved ones might be things like oregano and thyme. They're easier to handle when they're left on the stem. Um, yeah, now we went backwards. Okay, um, there are two basic ways to preserve herbs. One is by drying, and that can be done by air drying, drying in the oven, in the microwave, in a dehydrator. And um, another way of drying things is in silica sand, but that's not used for herbs. It's only for non-food uses, like you might be preserving a uh, corsage or some flowers or something. The other way is by freezing. So we'll talk a little bit about both of those. Um, if you're going to be air drying, you want to bind together small bundles of stems with a string or a rubber band. The rubber band is preferred because um, as the stems dry, they're gonna shrink a little bit and the rubber band will still be holding them together. If you got them tied together with a string and they shrink, they sometimes fall out of that um, string where that's holding them. Then hang them upside down in a warm, dry, dark, well-ventilated area. And you want to avoid areas where there's a lot of dust because you're going to be eating these herbs and you don't wanna have them full of dust. Then label the bundles because they all look very similar when they're dry. This is if you're drying more than one kind at one time. Um, another way of drying, you, the herbs can be covered by poking holes in the bottom of paper bags. Pull the stem through the hole in the bottom of the upside down paper bag and then hang it up. And this will kind of keep the, you know, if you do happen to have a dusty area, that will help to uh, keep the dust off of the, the leaves. Um, drying time is usually one to two weeks. Um, you can test by touching the leaves. They should feel dry and they should crumble easily. 
The stems are going to take a lot longer to dry than the leaves, um, which is why you usually take the leaves off the stem before you store them for long term. Um, if the leaves are large and the stem is thick, the leaves can be removed from the stem and laid on a screen um, that can be used for drying. You only want one layer of leaves deep though, and then cover that lightly with a cloth, again, to keep off flies and, and dust and that sort of thing. Oven drying um, will go a little bit quicker and you take this, the leaves off the stem and put them in a screen type tray in a single layer. The oven temperature should only be 100 to 110 degrees. The higher the temperature you use it will cost more loss of essential oils and therefore you won't have as much flavor in the leaves um, when they're dried. You need to keep the oven door open and check about every 20 minutes. It's going to take one to several hours depending on the number of leaves you have in the oven, how thick the leaves are, um, and um, the oven temperature itself. The herbs, again, should feel dry and crumble easily when they're finished. Microwave drying is the fastest, but it's the least desirable way to do it. Uh, microwaves vary so much in the amount of power they have that it's um, kind of an experiment each time you do it. I, I can't tell you how long to heat it because your microwave would be different than mine. Um, so it's kind of an experiment. The object is to dry the herb, not cook it. And that's a kind of a fine designation when you're using a microwave because it's really easy to cook something, not just dry it out. Um, start with 15 second intervals and check to see that the herbs are thoroughly dry again before you um, package them. And like I said, microwave wattages and sizes vary so much, you need to experiment to find the right amount of time. But the key here is um, trying not to cook it uh, rather than dry it. Dehydrators are probably the most reliable way to, to use heat to do it. Um, follow the directions of the manufacturer of your dehydrator. You want to use the lowest heat setting possible and don't crowd the leaves on the trays. And again, your test for dryness is, to, is whether the leaves crumble and um, feel dry to the touch. High heat, again, will rob the flavorful oils out of the herbs. So you want to use the lowest heat setting or whatever is recommended with the directions of your manufacturer. If you want to dry for the seeds, for example, dill and coriander and things like that, um, again, tie the stems of the seed heads together with a string or rubber band, with the rubber band being the preferred way to do it. Punch holes in the sides of a large paper bag, this time, not the bottom. Tie the bag, the top of the bag, around the stems of the herb bundle and so that the, the herbs are hanging upside down in the bag with the heads down. And then hang that whole thing in a dry ventilated area. As the seeds dry, they will fall off the, the seed head and collect in the bottom of the bag. And then you can just pour them out when, you're, when they're all dry. Um, once you have the leaves of the herbs dried, um, you want to strip them off the stems because the stems are not going to be as dry as the leaves. And if you have any moisture in the jar <clears throat> with the leaves, it will cause them to mold. Um, dried herbs should be packaged in airtight glass jars for best keeping. And be sure to label each jar because at this point, they all look like dried green leaves. Um, so it's really hard to tell which herb is which. You want to keep them in a cool, dark, dry storage area. Um, as just as a general note, keeping spices and herbs above the range or near the range is probably the worst place due to the water vapor and the heat that's generated when you cook. I know it's the most convenient place, but it's probably not the best place for the herbs and spices. Dried herbs can also be stored in the freezer if you wish, but um, it's kind of like a double, doing double duty. They'll store just as well outside of the freezer as in the freezer. 
Um, freezing herbs. Most herbs do not need to be blanched um, when they're frozen, except for basil. Small leaf herbs like dill can be frozen on the stem by placing them on a tray in the freezer and then package them in a container when they're frozen. Larger leaves can be placed individually on trays or cookie sheets and packaged when frozen. Um, another way to do it is to chop the herbs and place them in an ice cube tray and then cover the, the leaves with water and freeze. And then when, you, um, when they're frozen, you can take those herb cubes and put them in um, some kind of freezer proof container. And that way um, you can get out just one little cube of herbs and put that in soups or stews or, or um, other dishes that you're cooking. Um, if you know that you use a certain amount, um, you can measure that into the ice cube tray and then you know when you pull it out, you'll have the right amount of herbs for a recipe. Basil needs to be blanched. Um, it doesn't have to be blanched long though. If you don't blanch it, it will turn black in the freezer. Um, so put the basil leaves into a strainer or a colander and pour boiling water over them. That's, that's the only amount of time that you need to blanch basil. It's a very thin leaf and um, it doesn't take long to do it. Then drain them and freeze them in the size portions that you think you'll need. Or you can place again the blanched basil into ice cube trays, cover them with water and freeze. Um, in any case, after you've frozen all these herbs, you wanna put them in freezer um, protective containers, whether that's um, glass containers with uh, screw on covers or it's plastic containers, that type of thing. So you wanna keep them from drying out in the freezer. Um, once the herbs are frozen, we just talked about that, seal tightly, label them, and you can store up to six months in the freezer. Frozen herbs will have a wilted softer texture, but they can still be used in cooking um, and not so much for fresh eating, but in cooking, they're fine. Um, using herbs, you can chop herbs with a sharp knife or kitchen scissors the, using the roll method, or you can buy specially designed tools for chopping and, and slicing herbs. The roll method, um, you do it by placing several leaves on top of each other. So you make a pile of leaves and then you roll them up and then you slice across the roll like you're slicing to make um, refrigerator cookies or cinnamon rolls. Um, that way you're slicing a whole bunch of leaves at once and it saves a lot of time. Generally, we don't put herbs in blenders to chop them. Um, they usually turn into puree before they get chopped and the chopping will probably be, probably be very uneven. So you'll have some that have been liquefied and some that will be in big pieces yet. In any case, stuff, tough stems should not be included in foods generally. In order to get the leaves off the stem, run your fingers down the stem from the top of the, the branch to the bottom. And this is strips the leaves off the stem quite easily. Um, when you're cooking, when to add herbs to cooking, we wanna add dried herbs at the beginning or middle of the cooking time. Um, it takes longer for them to rehydrate and release the oils. You wanna add fresh herbs near the end of the cooking time because um, it, it's much easier to release the oils and the flavor from the fresh leaves. More delicate herbs can be added in the last 20 minutes. Those that are hardier can be added more um, earlier in the cooking. Um, the more delicate the herb, generally the rule is the shorter the cooking time, sometimes as little as two or three minutes. And your recipes, if they contain herbs, usually tell you to put it in when you start cooking something or to put it in near the end. Um, many people also save some of the fresh herbs to use as a garnish um, to make the dish look nice and for greater flavor, to accent the flavor of whatever kind of herb you have in the dish. Um, if you're going to use herbs in cold foods, you wanna add the herbs a few hours before serving. That allows the flavors to develop a little bit more. The cold temperatures and lack of cooking makes the flavors take longer to blend and for the oils to um, come out of the leaves and actually enter the food that you're trying to flavor. 
Um, herb pairings with foods. Oh, there's so, so many of them. Um, consult cookbooks, the internet for common herb uses. Many times you will find charts of common herb food combinations. Um, don't be afraid to try new recipes with unfamiliar herbs. Um, you might find an herb that you just really like. Um, and another thing you can do with herbs is to substitute one herb for another one in a recipe that you use to give a little bit change of flavor and, and um, up the, um, the food that you're serving. Um, when using herbs and you're not quite sure you want to add a new herb to something, start with a quarter teaspoon and then taste and see if you need more or less. Um, a rule of thumb, if you double a recipe, only use one and a half times the amount of herbs, not two times. Um, you can always adjust and add more, but many times um, the herb goes farther in a bigger recipe. Um, if you're substituting a fresh herb for a dried, let's say it calls for dried oregano and you wanna use fresh oregano out of your garden, um, if the recipe calls for one fourth teaspoon of powdered herbs, you would use a tablespoon of fresh. If it calls for one teaspoon of crushed herbs, which are, there's more airspace in crushed herbs than um, powdered herbs, you would use again, one tablespoon of fresh. And to go the other way, let's say the recipe calls for fresh um, basil, you would use one third less crushed dried herbs than fresh, or one eighth of a teaspoon of powdered herbs and then add more to taste. So you can go either way. You can start with fresh and substitute with dried or start with dried and substitute with fresh. Um, the advantages of cooking with herbs. Herbs add unique flavors to foods and many of our um, ethnic foods, different uh, countries have different herbs that they're used to using and you can recognize the, the country that our food came from often by the herbs and spices that are used in the cooking. Herbs are also um, great things to use to reduce the need for salt in foods. You can add a lot of herbs and not even miss the salt that you don't have in it. Um, herbs are beginning to be recognized as an important nutrient source. We talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, we know that some of them are high in certain vitamins and antioxidants. And we also know that some of those vitamins and antioxidants um, have healthful effects that they can contribute to our diet and our health. Um, some other things you can do with herbs, um, make flavored vinegars. Um, you've probably heard of tarragon vinegar and that sort of thing. Um, that's done by placing the dried herbs in the vinegar or the fresh herbs. You can make herb butters by um, mixing in herbs into like butter, like chives or garlic or that sort of thing, um, oregano, and then use that as spreads on bread. Um, you can use it in potpourris. You can make, steep them to make tea. Um, you can use them as garnishes. You can put them in as part of floral arrangements. Some herbs are really kind of unique uh, foliage and so they add to floral arrangements too. And you can add them to flower gardens. Um, they often bring a scent to flower gardens, especially if the flowers you have are not particularly uh, scenty. Um, some people put herbs in oils. This is kind of a risky thing to do. Um, moisture without air is a good place for botulism to grow. The spores can be on those herbs and then without air, botulism grows in an anaerobic environment, which means it does not need oxygen to grow. So it can multiply in your oil and um, be a source of very serious illness, if not death. Um, if you are doing herb oils, um, refrigerate them and use within one week if you're using fresh herbs. Um, wash and dry the fresh herbs thoroughly. The drying part is really important because you don't want any water to be in there. Um, 
And the washing also is very important because you don't want any bacteria or as little bacteria and things as you, you can have. A better solution if you want to do herb oils is to dry the herbs and then add them to the oils. And about one tablespoon of crushed herbs can be used to a, a cup or so of oil. Um, I would still would use those within a short time though and keep them refrigerated. Um, when we're talking about herbs, um, a little bit of a side light here. I want to talk about two. Um, you can eat many flowers. I don't know if many people know that, um, but there are some caveats when you're going to do this. Do not eat flowers if you have asthma, allergies, or hay fever, because some of those same chemicals that give you those allergies and hay fever um, could be in the flowers of the plants. You need to eat only those that have been grown organically and have no pesticide residue. So you would not want to eat flowers collected from roadsides where they can have all kinds of contaminants from gasoline and exhaust and all those kinds of things. You do not want to eat flowers from florists, garden centers, or nurseries because those I can almost guarantee have been sprayed with some kind of pesticides, insecticides, or other types of chemicals to make the flowers uh, bloom and, and come to market without being damaged by diseases and insects. You do not want to eat flowers that have been grown with animal manure fertilizer. So anything that fertilizer that's um, comes from chickens, rabbits, cows, sheep, horses, um, if it's been grown in soil that's been fertilized with that kind of manure, you don't want to eat that either. And of course, do not eat any diseased flowers. It's probably not real palatable anyway. Um, some edible beef, uh, edible flowers include bee balm or monarda, um, borage, calendula or pot marigold, daylilies, Johnny jump ups or violets, lavender, marigolds, nasturtium, roses, scented geraniums, and sweet peas. Um, if you're going to harvest flowers for eating, collect them in the cooler parts of the day. Again, a lot like your herbs, preferably early in the morning after the dew has evaporated. Choose flowers that are at their peak. Um, you wanna avoid those that are not fully open or that are starting to wilt. Those are not at their peak. Immediately before using, you want to wash the flowers, check in again for bugs and soil, um, just like you would with other herbs or vegetables. And then most times you need to reduce the stamens and the styles from flowers before eating. The pollen sometimes has a different flavor and it can detract from the flavor of the flower itself. And as we talked earlier, some people can be allergic to the pollen. And you want to remove the sepals of all flowers, except for violas, Johnny jump ups, and pansies, which are all in the same family. And when we talk about what parts are those, okay, the sepals are these like coverings that are around the butt of the flower, and they're usually at the base of the flower petals. And they often um, hold the flower petals or curl back maybe when the flower opens. Um, the um, style is the middle part of the flower here where the seeds would form eventually. And the stamens are those pollen producing parts of the plant. Um, they're really, really evident in lilies if you've seen those. Um, so you wanna take out that middle part of the flower. Um, you want to eat only the petals of roses, calendula, tulips, chrysanthemums, yucca, and lavender. Um, roses, dianthus, English daisies, signet marigolds, and chrysanthemums have a bitter white portion at the base of the petal where it was attached to the flower. You would remove this before you eat those. Um, dandelions are another um, herb that we don't oftentimes think of as an herb. We think of it as a weed, but originally it was brought to the United States in herb gardens by people who enjoy dandelion leaves in salads and cooked as a green. The flowers are edible when they're young. They become bitter with age, however, 
and you want to remove the dandelion sepals. Those are the green things at the base of the, the flower because they are the bitter part. You can eat both the flowers and the leaves of nasturtiums. And you can eat some vegetable flowers, including squash blossoms. And you may have heard of stuffed squash blossoms, which is a, a common way of eating those. Uh, what do they taste like? Nasturtium leaves and flowers have kind of a peppery taste. Calendula flowers do also. Squash blossoms have kind of a cucumber-like flavor, which you would kind of expect because they're a cucurbit. Pansies and violets are sweet. Um, roses are kind of described as a sweet flower too. And you can also use these edible flowers as garnishes for food. Um, and when you, if you're gonna use it as a garnish, you wanna prepare it in the same way that you would as if you were going to eat it because all garnishes on food should be edible. Um, some other things to remember if you're gonna try eating flowers, um, introduce them gradually, use a little bit at a time at first to see if anybody's allergic to it um, or if you even like the flavor. Be very, very certain of the identity of the plant you eat. We don't wanna be eating anything that's not um, what you think it is. And consult the resource list that I gave you in depth for information about edible flowers. Um, any questions? I said I would talk a little bit about jumping worms. Um, we've been doing a lot of education of people um, at the fair and at the Maple Fall Fest, at the farmer's markets. Jumping worms are an invasive um, worm from Asia. They don't actually jump, but um, if you pick up a regular earthworm that we have here, when it moves, it kind of um, squiggles into a circle or kind of twists around itself. Uh, a jumping worm moves more like a snake. Um, some other differences are the jumping worm, um, is a little bit smaller than an, an earthworm or a night crawler, definitely smaller than a night crawler. Um, the color is a more of a gray, brown, pink, where, where our earthworms are pretty much pink. Most people would describe them as pink. Um, there's a band around worms called the clitellum. On a jumping worm, that band is flat. It's even with the, the um, sides of the jumping worm. In our earthworms, it's a raised band and it doesn't go all the way around the body of the worm. The clitellum is also closer to the head on a jumping worm. The reason that we are really concerned about this is because jumping worms are voracious eaters. And when they get into the soil of a garden or a woods, they eat everything that's organic. Um, if you have leaves, for example, in a, in a woods, um, you have mulch in your garden maybe, they eat everything. Um, and uh, the excrement of the worm is much different than that of the earthworm. It's much larger, it's much coarser. It, if you have these, the ground, surface of your ground often looks like coffee grounds. And these castings um, do not hold water. Um, they don't have much nutrient value. And so it becomes very hard to grow plants in that soil after the jumping worms have gone through it and depleted it of anything that plants need. Um, we're really concerned about them because they're showing up in more places around the United States. They, we know they're in Madison, we know they're in Wisconsin Rapids. Um, it's questionable whether they're in the Marshfield area. We aren't sure right now. Um, but there are three ways that they are, three main ways that they're spread. 
One of them is by sharing plants between people. So you dig up a uh, part of your hosta and take it and give it to a friend or a neighbor or a relative and they plant it. And of course you take some soil along with it. <clears throat> you could have worms uh, in that soil. You could also have the eggs called the cocoons in that soil. And um, then you take it and you plant it in your friend, neighbor, relative's garden. And now they have jumping worms also. Um, the second way is if you work in a garden that has jumping worms and you don't clean off your shoes, your boots, your tools, the tires of um, vehicles or tools that you use, um, you can spread the cocoons, especially to another garden. And the third way is by contaminated mulch or compost. So if you're buying um, mulch or compost from someone, ask them what they do to control jumping worms. Um, if they kind of look at you and say, jumping worms, um, you can guarantee that they're not doing anything. And so it's a, it's a hazard probably to buy um, the mulch or compost from those providers. So it's something that we're really working to let people know because you can imagine if these um, get loose in large areas of our forests, you won't have regeneration um, of trees. Um, if they get into our farm fields, you won't have good soil to grow crops. So it's, it's really quite a problem. Um, they're probably not as prominent as say Japanese beetles, which we've been dealing with but they do a lot of damage also. So um, I don't know if anybody has any more questions on that or any other of the topics we talked about. I thought I saw a question in the chat. Maybe it got... Yeah, it was just Melissa thanking us for hosting and that she said it was very interesting to learn from you and she said to have a great night. Oh, okay. Um, I have a little further um, thing here. If you want to take a little test to see how you good at how good you are at identifying herbs. Um, you want to take out a uh, if you if you printed the handout. There's a space on the back where you can write your answers. Otherwise, you can maybe just jot them down. Um, I wonder if you can identify this plant. This is one of the harder ones um, because it looks similar to a couple other ones. Um, this plant has light purple to pink flowers. It only gets about six to 12 inches tall. It's a tender perennial, which means it um, needs to be kind of covered or sheltered during the winter time for it to, to, just, to uh, survive the winter. So I don't know if anybody has any idea what that might be. You wanna put your, write your guess down. Um, this, uh, herb has tiny greenish or yellow white flowers um, and it's a perennial which means it will come back year after year. This is not a real common one probably for most people. Um, number three is not hardy over the winter in Wisconsin. It's, it's a small evergreen shrub. Actually it can it can grow to maybe two, three feet. It has blue flowers when it flowers. Um, and you would use the leaves and the stems of this plant in cooking. Uh, this plant is a biennial, which means it takes two seasons to flower. So unless you leave it in the ground over the winter, you probably won't see flowers on this one but it's often used um, as a garnish. That might give you a clue. It grows nine to 12 inches tall. This one can have purple, pink, blue, or white flowers. It has that fuzzy looking texture you see there and the ladybug. This one has purple to blue flowers. It's a common kitchen herb. This one might be confused with the first one, but it has rose purple flowers or sometimes white flowers. 
I'll give you a hint, it's used in Italian cooking. This one has, it's a perennial, it has square stems and it could have purple, pink or white flowers. And if you were listening earlier, it's one you wanna be careful where you plant. This one you might recognize. Again, it's used in Italian cookie, cooking. It can also have purple leaves sometimes and usually white or purple flowers. This one gets a yellow flower head and it's an annual. It produces a bulb that's used in cooking as well as the leaves. This one is sometimes used as a landscape plant. It gets blue flowers. It can get to be one to three feet tall and wide and it comes back every year. This one is a perennial, uh, kind of looks like one of the first ones we had, um, one to three feet high and it gets white flowers. This one is kind of a common one, um, might be one that you've seen before. It's one to three feet tall, it's an annual. This one too is often confused with a couple of those other tiny leaf plants. It's again, an, uh, probably used in Italian cooking most often, one to three feet tall, uh, red, pink, or white flowers. And this one is a tree. It gets 30 to 40 feet tall. It doesn't grow in Wisconsin. It's zone eight hardy or higher, and it gets pink, white or red flowers. So let's back up here. I think I will escape and we'll go back to the beginning and start from the beginning. It's easier than going back, 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 back. Okay, anybody know this one? When I did this in person, we used to, to um, people would be shouting out answers. This one is thyme, T-H-Y-M-E. Parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. This one is tarragon. This one is rosemary. This one is parsley, not cilantro. Cilantro looks very close too. This one is sage. Probably would have gotten it if I told you it was used in a lot in Thanksgiving cooking. Chives, oregano, mint, Remember the one that you're not supposed to plant unless it's contained, unless you want it all over your garden. Basil, fennel, lavender, lemon balm, dill, marjoram, and bay leaf. How would everybody do? Anybody get them all right? Anybody get half right? Wait for see if anybody comments here. Yeah, we have a very quiet crew tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, with that, I guess we're gonna close um, unless you have further questions.
I'll be glad to answer anything related to gardening as best I can. And um, we're always looking for topics for future programs. So if you have any topics, you can put those into the Q&A um, or the chat. And um, Andrea and I, or I will pick them up from there. I'm thinking of doing one on composting and maybe one on all those um, invasive things we he keep hearing about like Japanese beetles and jumping worms and things. So um, those might be two possible programs coming up unless I have some other topics of interest. Well, it looks like Melissa said that she had six right. Oh, good. Yeah, those ones with tiny leaves, marshmallow, thyme, and oregano, they're really hard unless you can actually smell them. Yeah. <laughs> and Claire said, thank you so much. That was a lot of fun and informative. Okay. All right. A lot couple more minutes for questions. And remember, you can ask questions about anything. Donna is very knowledgeable in a lot of things. And if she doesn't have the answer, she can always find the answer. So I don't know. I think you're you're saved from being put on the spot, Donna. <laughs> oh, that's a good thing, I guess. <laughs> Can't believe I answered everyone's questions, but <laughs> no. All right. Well, I'll say thank you for everybody coming and watching this, whether it's was live or on YouTube later. Um, thank you so much. We're signing off from the Everett Rail Marshfield Public Library. And thank you, thank you, Donna, again, for this month's um, Garden Guru program. It's very much appreciated for all the information you share with us. My pleasure.